So before I introduce Dr. O'Gara, I just want to take a moment now uh, just to recognize this lecture. This is the Michael Davidson lecture. Um, this lecture was started actually by uh, Michael's Yale Med School class of 1996, um, and they started this after his tragic um, death. I had the opportunity actually to first meet Mike at a Yale uh, Med School reunion. Um, Mike did his uh, medical school at Yale and then went to Duke for residency and then went to Brigham and Women's where he became director of endovascular surgery there. Um, I had met Mike briefly at a med school reunion and then had the opportunity actually to go to Brigham and, er and proctor some early TAVR cases and spend a lot of time with Dr. Davidson there. He was actually the first cardiac surgeon that I ever met who was truly leading a structural program. Um, and it became very clear to me that in order for a structural program to have success, it needed to have a cardiac surgeon um, who was at the helm, not behind an interventional cardiologist or, or behind a cardiologist, but really sitting there with the cardiologist leading the way. And Mike was truly doing that. Um, I spent a lot of time during that visit talking with Mike about future endovascular innovations. He was already talking about mitral and tricuspid therapies. It was clear that he was a true inner innovator um, in the field there. Um, for some of you who don't know, he was uh, tragically killed while at work. Um, but you know, his legacy has lived on, and one of the legacies that is uh, one of the ways that his legacy has lived on is through this lecture series. Um, I'll share just a little story with about Mike. You know, I, I really think that his innovation um, and thinking outside the box was present in so many areas of his life, including the fact that he played in a rock band. And when you look, look when you talk to him about his rock band and a little bit more about it, he played uh, the bass guitar and appropriately his rock band was named Off Label, which I think sort of shows what he was thinking about sort of the future of medicine, the future of endovascular therapies, et cetera. We're really uh, fortunate today to have Dr. O'Gara here. Dr. O'Gara obviously needs little introduction, and so I won't spend a lot of time. He currently serves as uh, professor of medicine and the director of strategic uh, medicine at Brigham and Women. He's a former president of the ACC, currently is associate editor at JAMA Cardiology, and is really a world-renowned leader in the field, having authored more than 250 manuscripts. I do want to just uh, give a little recognition to him and then also to the rest of our faculty. I had the pleasure of spending several days with Dr. O'Gara era last year at the Rick Nishimura and Patrick O'Gara Emerging Faculty Leadership Academy at the American College of Cardiology. It was really an amazing experience and I would encourage any of the young faculty members to, to look into it, to apply to it, getting to spend time uh, with Pat and Rick and the other really world leaders is truly something that um, has, impact, has had impacts on my career and I think is something that we should take uh, value of. I'll give just a little little thing about Pat. Uh, like Michael, he uh, is a graduate of Yale. Pat went to uh, Yale for undergrad um, and was actually a member of the Yale baseball team here. Uh, Pat, I'm sorry that you can't join us in person, um, but I do promise next time you come here, we'll get you to Maury's where you won't have to foot the bill. So welcome and thank you. Well, thanks very much, John, for that uh, nice introduction and for those very uh, heartfelt words regarding uh, the late Dr. Michael Davidson. I want to thank you personally, as well as Eric, for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, to speak with you, even remotely uh, by Zoom during this uh, weird um, pandemic in which we uh, find ourselves. Uh, there are a lot of uh, friends and mutual acquaintances and colleagues uh, on the call, and I really do appreciate your taking time out of your busy, busy schedules. There are so many people there that I would like to recognize. Uh, I see Barry Zarrett and Franz Walkers, and I'm reminded of the days that I worked for Bob Bono as a nuclear cardiologist at the NIH in the mid-1980s. Uh, and uh, scrutinized their work uh, quite carefully uh, in order to design uh, studies that Steve Epstein would find fault with. Uh, and certainly, um, I think any talk uh, from a clinician like myself that fails to recognize the influence of Dr. Larry Cohen, who is also uh, here on the phone, um, would be, I think, empty uh, without um, uh, acknowledging uh, the impact that Dr. Cohen had on so many of us, even though we didn't study under him directly uh, at Yale. Uh, my friend uh, Harlan uh, Krumholtz and his um, 
uh, incredibly successful protégés, Nihar Desai, and well as Tariq Ahmad, and uh, some other folks like Dan Price and Judy Meadows, who I'm not seen in a long period of time. And uh, my friend Mark Schoenfeld, lots of time at St. Raphael's Hospital. Uh, Mark and I were residents together, uh, and uh, I always admired uh, his uh, extraordinary uh, ability to uh, speak uh, as well as um, to articulate uh, uh, very controversial points in such an entertaining uh, yet educational way. Uh, so obviously, uh, I'm flattered, uh, and I hope very much that in the next uh, 35 uh, to 40 minutes or so, I can share some thoughts that I've had regarding uh, the current challenges that are facing multidisciplinary uh, heart teams in the management of patients with uh, valvular uh, heart disease. Uh, let me start by uh, acknowledging uh, some uh, potential uh, disclosures. I've been working with the Cardiothoracic Surgery Network for the past nine years or so. This is an NHLBI-sponsored um, activity uh, in which um, we design trials or observational registries uh, that exist at the interface between cardiac surgery, interventional cardiology, and general cardiology. I'm on the executive committee in unpaid positions for the two trials that you see regarding transcatheter uh, therapies. Uh, we've taken a page out of the playbook of Chris O'Connor and uh, have recently uh, put together a heart valve collaboratory, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder um, initiative uh, that is uh, chaired by Michael Mack and Marty Leon uh, with input from Bram Zuckerman and Chang Fu Wu at the FDA. Uh, it's also attended by um, <clears throat> our representatives from industry and the device companies that have helped uh, put this field on the map over the course of the past 10 years. <clears throat> So I think uh, uh, a few words about Mike. Um, I worked closely with Mike while he was here. Uh, it's extraordinary that it's been uh, over five years uh, since uh, he was tragically uh, murdered uh, in our uh, clinic examination uh, rooms. Uh, and uh, his colleagues, I think, struggled heroically <clears throat> to try to uh, save him uh, in the operating room, but uh, it, his, uh, his wounds were beyond uh, repair. Michael really was a Renaissance man. I think John's comments are right on target. Uh, Michael was a trained cardiac surgeon who took a year off, uh, a full year, uh, and uh, performed interventional cardiology as an advanced fellow. Under the director, director, uh, direction of Andy Eisenhower, who is one of the people here, if you can see my pointer uh, in the photo below Michael, uh, Andy was really the uh, first interventional cardiologist around whom our structural heart team uh, took uh, shape. Uh, Michael ran marathons. He was an outstanding gourmet cook. Uh, as you know, he played in a rock band as well, uh, had four children, uh, and a, a loving wife, a plastic surgeon at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess. Uh, his, his departure here had an enormous effect on all of us in cardiac surgery and cardiology and across the hospital and the Brigham family for a long period of time. <clears throat> and we still remember Michael on a daily basis. Uh, all of our uh, logos are um, inclusive of his, um, <clears throat> of his name, uh, much like you see George Steinbrenner's initials on the uh, outfits of the uh, pinstripers from New York. Uh, we have an MJD uh, that emblazons uh, the uh, structural heart disease uh, sweaters uh, and uh, jackets uh, that have become so popular, I think, in the current era. So this is for Mike. Um, we had uh, an opportunity at ACC 2015 in San Diego to put together a video tribute to Mike. Uh, it was my pleasure to, at that time, uh, have uh, uh, interacted with uh, Bob and Sue Davidson uh, from Los Angeles. I know it's way too early for them to be in attendance, and I hope that we can record this session uh, for their uh, perusal at a later time. I did subsequently meet with Bob about a year or two later out at uh, Cedar sinai when I was uh, visiting there as well. Uh, so <clears throat> Mike has had a huge impact. He continues to have an impact, and I hope that we can all uh, emulate uh, his spirit, his energy, and his creativity. So here are the objectives for the talk. 
uh, they're somewhat aspirational. You know, when you see objectives like this for a grand rounds talk or a core curriculum talk, you usually want to walk away uh, with mastering knowledge of one, one to two or one to three issues. Um, but I'd like us to acknowledge individual patient attributes that should prompt personalized decision making. I think that uh, my, my hope is that uh, uh, before I um, end my practice of uh, clinical cardiology that we're actually able to bring the principles of precision medicine to the care of the patients that we serve. We need to recognize the knowledge and treatment gaps that continue to surround us in the care of patients with valvular heart disease. And I'm only going to point out a couple. And then finally, to identify new as well as old targets for active investigation across the entire spectrum of research, ranging from basic to translational, to clinical, to interventional, and to population. So if you're like me, and I suspect most of you are not like me, uh, first of all, I'm probably older than the average person who is attending these uh, rounds. As Nihar knows, I'm not young anymore. Um, but I wake up every morning wondering uh, how to maintain uh, my balance while I am bombarded, absolutely bombarded by streams of information from uh, multiple, multiple directions, if not 360 degrees. Uh, I don't participate actively in Twitter, TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, or any of those other uh, social media platforms because I'm really, really quite afraid that I wouldn't be able to keep up with them. Uh, I have enough trouble trying to <clears throat> read the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, et cetera, uh, to main, uh, maintain currency. Uh, and as a deputy editor for JAMA Cardiology, I'm drowning uh, in uh, trying to uh, analyze papers uh, that are completely outside my field of expertise, let alone my uh, training as a clinical cardiologist. I think that uh, what we have learned over the course of the past 10 to 20 years is that uh, medical knowledge uh, might uh, double uh, every day uh, to the extent that there are so many bits of information, it's very difficult for us to keep track of them. And we need help. We need guidance. It takes a village. It takes a team. And long gone are the days of the rugged individualist who could uh, prize a, a patient um, from um, a, a distance uh, and uh, be able to um, shepherd uh, him or her uh, through the uh, gauntlet of uh, either medical care or interventional care. Uh, so uh, kudos uh, to all of us <clears throat> and all of you who continue to educate each of us every day. We have the benefit of this family of uh, academic cardiology that should keep us current and should keep us vibrant. But I should, uh, I think, point out, uh, should also make us acknowledge uh, that we can't possibly, we can't possibly uh, know all that there is to know about even any one particular area of cardiology anymore. So these are really two of the principles that I, I would like you to keep in mind, uh, both this morning as well as hereafter, and that is, it's important to try to maintain equipoise uh, when considering patients' problems and what you, uh, as an individual, might think uh, could be the best solution to those problems. Um, I would uh, caution all of us uh, to uh, exercise restraint uh, when providing recommendations for care, uh, given the extraordinary biases that can creep into our conversations, uh, whether it's verbal, uh, whether it's actually uh, some visual display uh, or, or whether it's an expression of, of uh, a negative statement along the lines of, well, you don't really want to have surgery, do you? Uh, that's a very nice example of a leading question, of course, for which my mentor, Dr. DeSanctis, uh, would um, always correct me. Uh, so I think equipoise is important. Equanimity is also important, of course, and tolerance, uh, tolerance for different viewpoints. And I think in the crush of activity uh, and in the hurly-burly of our daily uh, work schedules, it's very easy uh, to extract information from an echocardiogram, for example, or and make offhanded recommendations quickly and then have a sense of accomplishment that you can move patients through the system uh, as rapidly and as efficiently uh, as everybody would like because everyone is breathing down our necks, whether you work in New Haven or in Boston. Uh, but certainly uh, medicine is a, a class field and we spend most of our days dealing with patients who have class 2B indications for considering some kind of an intervention. And secondly, I'd like us to take the long view. 
And what we decide today may be in the best interest of the patient for the next year or so, but we, have we adequately considered the implications of such decision-making over a 10 or 15 year time horizon? This becomes increasingly important as younger and younger patients are coming to us asking for less and less invasive interventions, the durability of which is, uh, has yet to be proven. So I do think we have to be careful uh, and uh, look uh, longer uh, over the time horizon. So here's an area I think that continues to challenge me. And I've talked about this before and I've shared some of these uh, considerations uh, with mem several of you over time. And that is the best approach to the asymptomatic patient. You see here valve intervention at the fulcrum in the middle of this particular diagram and on the left are the risks associated with an intervention, whether it's surgical or transcatheter or even medical for that matter. And on the right, the potential or putative benefits in the asymptomatic patient for whom ostensibly we're not gonna make them feel better by any type of intervention. We hope of course that our intervention will prove beneficial by virtue of its effects on altered pathophysiology or its effects on altered myocardial structure or perhaps the electrical substrate, uh, or perhaps a predisposition to heart failure. All of those things, I think, in certain observational series uh, could come home to roost, um, but it's, it's a fairly clear, of course, that when you're looking at valvular heart disease over a long time horizon, it's very difficult to know things uh, in um, a, a strict uh, way, as might otherwise be informed by a randomized trial. On the other hand, of course, there are risks. Not everybody who goes through surgery for asymptomatic severe primary mitral regurgitation comes out with a perfect result or retrospectively develops atrial fibrillation as a complication of the surgery, which is common. And then the atrial fibrillation becomes increasingly difficult to treat over the course of the next five years. And these are many patients, of course, who don't have atrial fibrillation prior to surgery. There are morbidity issues, there are mortality issues, there are stroke issues. There are issues related, of course, to the acquisition of prosthetic valve or prosthetic ring uh, endocarditis over time. And then this gnarly question about optimal antithrombotic therapy across the spectrum of valvular heart disease, uh, whether it's in patients who have sinus rhythm or those who have atrial fibrillation. And of course, we integrate this kind of uh, decision-making uh, on um, a substrate that, that accounts for the patient's age, the patient's gender, the patient's values, preferences, living situation, and likelihood of, of, of a, a functional result over a long time horizon that allows them to be as active and productive as they would like. Now, of course, the obverse of this kind of uh, heuristic is um, what, what about the consideration of not doing anything for the asymptomatic patient? What's the risk of sitting on one's hands? What's the risk of uh, providing a schedule of very assiduous clinical or echocardiographic or functional or exercise testing follow-up? And what's the benefit of uh, that kind of uh, strategy? And then how, of course, do you manage the patient's increasing apprehension uh, that they will one day uh, have to probably uh, face uh, the music and undergo procedure when they're uh, older? Uh, I think that uh, all of these are somewhat nuanced areas uh, for which individual decision making is obviously appropriate. So here's a routine case. Right? This is a 27-year-old fellow that um, was uh, sent to me for a, an opinion about what to do. Um, he is a roofer from Maine. And as you know, for all of you who've had the benefit of taking care of uh, the great people from the state of Maine whom we love, uh, they usually don't like to see uh, doctors. In fact, uh, they do what they can not to see uh, doctors, but he'd fallen off a roof, went to an emergency room for treatment of his orthopedic injury. Somebody heard a heart murmur and an echocardiogram was performed. And uh, even I can see that there's a, a lovely degree here of uh, posterior leaflet uh, prolapse, uh, mitral leaflets are a bit thickened. Looks like the atrium is a little bit enlarged. The ventricle may also be uh, dilated. We could measure that if we needed to. And then of course the um, uh, aortic uh, root here at the level of the sinuses also appears to be uh, dilated. And not surprisingly, uh, the color flow uh, Doppler information uh, suggests that he has some degree of mitral regurgitation. Um, this to me looks like a real life echo. Uh, 
uh, this to me looks like, gee, it would be hard for me to try to determine the severity of this mitral regurgitation based on this snapshot of information. And uh, echo is good, but echo, of course, can be uh, inexact. Uh, I think we all abide by recommendations from our colleagues at the American Society of Echocardiography to tease this out. But there are certain instances where moderately severe blends into severe or moderately severe blends into moderate, for which clinical judgment and integrative approach and a step back are, are typically uh, required. Sometimes it's not as easy as it appears on paper. So here's a fellow who was previously asymptomatic. He fell off the roof because he tripped. He didn't fall off the roof because of something that would conjure the notion of an arrhythmia. And he has asymptomatic, uh, turns out moderately severe mitral regurgitation by current criteria, and also an aortic root dimension uh, that uh, measured uh, 44 cent, uh, millimeters uh, by uh, a magnetic resonance angiography. And by the way, he had kind of long fingers and um, he had a funny bone structure. Uh, and uh, had a family history of uh, folks with um, defects in their chest and uh, nearsightedness and things of that sort. So here we've come across somebody who obviously has an inheritable disorder of connective tissue. He's got mitral disease, aortic root disease, and what will you do about it? Is this somebody for whom uh, preemptive surgery would be appropriate? And if you did preemptive surgery, do you do the mitral valve in the aortic root or do you just do the mitral valve? Uh, so certainly he went from having a nice a uh, heart murmur uh, to a, uh, a lovely echo to a very different set of uh, propositions regarding his appropriate uh, treatment. So what should we do with patients who have uh, severe primary mitral regurgitation? Well, I think if we were to abide by this observational study that was published seven years ago in JAMA from uh, Maurice Serrano and colleagues uh, looking at uh, a strategy of early surgical intervention versus watchful waiting in patients who are asymptomatic but had severe MR due to flail. Uh, you could see here that uh, with a propensity matched analysis and all of the problems that come with that that Nihar can uh, describe for us, uh, early surgery uh, seemed to associate with a uh, improved survival uh, compared against uh, medical management in patients who are presumably asymptomatic. If you read the fine print from this study, there are a lot of folks who were involved, uh, who were enrolled in this particular registry who were, quote, minimally symptomatic, that is short of breath for reasons that um, were apparently not attributable directly to the uh, mitral valve disease itself. Uh, so certainly this is a large data set, but um, confounding can al always uh, creep uh, into the precision by which uh, we uh, measure uh, trends in uh, patient outcomes uh, on the basis of such uh, data. When you contrast that particular data set with a data set that's far, far smaller, uh, but one that was uh, far more rigorously uh, obtained, uh, these are uh, some uh, pieces of information from Raphael Rosenheck, published now about almost 15 years ago in circulation, in which in his valve clinic, they followed patients with severe <clears throat> primary mitral regurgitation, including a subgroup here in yellow who had flail leaflet and severe mitral regurgitation and showed that with careful medical and echocardiographic follow-up <clears throat> and referral for surgery only for uh, uh, class one indications that uh, expected survival uh, was the same as that in the general population. Uh, so uh, certainly there are differences in the carefulness with which patients can be followed medically that could impact their long-term outcome and I think could impact uh, the decision-making as regards to early preemptive surgery versus watchful waiting. Of course, not everybody with a mitral valve prolapse is uh, born equally. Uh, here, of course, uh, I'm showing you a post-mortem examination <clears throat> of a patient with Barlow's uh, syndrome who died suddenly from a ventricular arrhythmia. And of course, uh, those of us who are just general valve cardiologists would look at that and say, how in the world could you put something like this back together? or even to ask our interventional colleagues, could you possibly do something with this with uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair? Now, this kind of anatomy seems to supersede uh, most of our efforts at um, uh, placing these patients into uh, highly categorized uh, buckets. Uh, as you can see, I think,
think uh, these are heaped up rolls of uh, grossly myxomatous uh, tissue. Um, certainly, uh, this is prolapse on uh, steroids. Uh, and what I would like to refer to is a postgraduate valve for whom uh, or for which uh, we need to be very careful with respect to prognostications uh, following attempted repair. <clears throat> and here's a patient of mine, the op editor, um, op page editor, I should say, uh, of a, uh, <clears throat> a newspaper in the United States who underwent uh, primary repair <clears throat> of uh, mitral valve disease uh, for uh, what was referred to as increasing left atrial enlargement over time. He had bileaflet prolapse, and this was an attempt at constructing neocordy to the anterior leaflet and doing a limited resection of the posterior leaflet. <clears throat> this is his post-operative echo. This is his post-operative echo that was obtained four days, four, excuse me, four months after attempted repair, in which previously asymptomatic individual now had symptoms of heart failure as well as uh, atrial fibrillation. And uh, the question, of course, came up in his care. Uh, he now met criteria on the basis of symptomatic severe primary previously repaired mitral regurgitation, <clears throat> reasonable preservation of LV systolic function. And in the current era, the question comes down to, can you re-repair this valve or should it be replaced a priori uh, so as to avoid the need of a potential third time uh, sternotomy? or a third time anterior thoracotomy. However, our surgical colleagues might want to approach something like this. And obviously I think the appetite to try to put something like this back together again with repair techniques will vary across institutions and across surgeons. He ended up having mechanical mitral valve replacement and has done well uh, for the uh, past uh, eight or nine years. Now, when we <clears throat> had attempted to put uh, some um, uh, pen to paper with respect to uh, this kind of decision-making for asymptomatic individuals with complex valvular heart disease, um, the, we uh, uh, eventually uh, landed uh, on a construct of, of the type that I'm showing you here, uh, in which this multi-society uh, group of experts from the surgical side, as well as the imaging, the interventional, and the general cardiology side, uh, attempted to define what's called the level one comprehensive valve center, the kind of comprehensive valve center at which John Forrest works and everyone there uh, supports. A uh, comprehensive valve center where you have the infrastructure, the personnel, and the experience to take on patients across the entire spectrum of structural and valvular heart disease, ranging from closure of paravalvular leaks to um, the participation in research trials uh, looking at device therapy for tricuspid regurgitation and everything in between. And there are a lot of uh, centers who don't have the kind of infrastructure uh, that exists there at Yale New Haven, even within the great state of Connecticut. Certainly there are um, rival and competitor, competitor um, valve centers in Hartford and Bridgeport and places of that sort. Uh, but there are other, like here in Massachusetts, uh, smaller hospitals uh, in which uh, the level of experience, expertise, and the degree of resources and infrastructure may not reach a, a, an appropriate threshold around which we would have confidence that decision-making uh, would always be in the best interest of the patient. I think in uh, some stark terms, uh, this kind of consideration also applies uh, to um, the <clears throat> reality that uh, there are more centers in the United States where uh, surgery uh, is offered for uh, treatment of aortic stenosis, then there are centers at which transcatheter aortic valve replacement uh, is available. And the asymmetry in um, the availability of resources can certainly um, drive uh, decision-making and or recommendations uh, for treatment. <clears throat> but you can imagine, I'm sure that uh, uh, you have also been part of these kinds of policy decisions, the extraordinary blowback uh, received um, by us in trying to define a level one comprehensive uh, valve center. We took uh, a page out of the playbook of our European colleagues. They had retreated completely uh, from trying to put down any uh, case numbers uh, that would um, <clears throat> constitute a volume minimum uh, above which uh, one could feel more comfortable that uh, institutions had the appropriate experience in order to provide appropriate uh, care. But nevertheless, uh, we did define it and, and put a lot of, of uh, uh, 
recommendations uh, for case volume as well as for the type of cases that would distinguish a level one from a level two valve center, much like we distinguish between level one trauma centers and level two trauma centers or level one stroke centers and level two stroke centers. Uh, this may become important in the future. I think time will tell. <clears throat> so here's a very nice example of a comprehensive valve center. If we really want to get serious, I think, about um, assessing our own individual quality, that of an institutional uh, nature and as well as an operator nature, uh, we should look to this publication now, which is quite old, in JTCBS from David Adams' group at Mount Sinai, in which he published his seven-year experience with mitral valve repair for primary MR. And you can see here that uh, they reported in this uh, single center observational data set a repair rate that was successful nearly 100% of the time. Obviously, there are some problems with single center reports of this nature. Uh, how can these be generalizable? And then, of course, how can they be verified, et cetera? But nevertheless, uh, this particular group, as you well know, has set a very high bar uh, for excellence in mitral valve repair. The kind of bar, I think, to which we would all aspire, especially when thinking of referring asymptomatic patients with severe primary MR. You want your patients to have the best opportunity to get the best result. These are the kinds of uh, outcomes uh, that one would consider absolutely necessary in order to increase your level of confidence. So let's turn our attention a little bit to uh, the uh, current um, focus of many efforts with respect to transcatheter intervention for mitral regurgitation, and that's the patient with secondary MR. I'm showing you an example of a patient who has uh, the ventricular form of secondary MR. That is secondary MR that uh, results from uh, abnormal distortion and function of the ventricle. In this case, uh, this is a patient with an ischemic cardiomyopathy. You can see a dilated uh, ventricle with multiple regional wall motion abnormalities, restriction of the leaflets uh, tenting uh, here at uh, end systole, failure of coaptation, and an extraordinarily enormous jet of uh, mitral regurgitation into the left atrium in this kind of foreshortened uh, two-chamber view. I think any of us would um, make a diagnosis here of uh, severe MR. What's the first principle, of course, is uh, heart failure heart failure. Heart failure requires the kind of heart failure treatment that <clears throat> Eric Velasquez and others have uh, taught us uh, over the years with um, respect to um, neurohormonal therapy, uh, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, et cetera, and the kind of tiered approach to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that should really be um, the uh, first order of uh, intervention. What I'm not going to talk about is a very interesting class of patients with secondary MR, namely those who have the so-called atrial functional MR, usually in the context of chronic persistent atrial fibrillation with annular dilatation and failure of the leaflets to elongate adequately, uh, rendering the valve incompetent. I think in those particular individuals, uh, maintenance of sinus rhythm can oftentimes prove the difference. Now, um, here's, here's the perspective from a general cardiologist uh, with respect to uh, the much discussed COAPT and MITRA FR trials. Um, these are extraordinary, extraordinary outcomes, are they not? Uh, and I would have to look to somebody like uh, Dr. Velasquez or Dr. Krumholtz, uh, Nihar, uh, others as to whether or not um, these kinds of treatment differences, um, and maybe Alexandra could uh, chime in as well, whether these treatment, different, uh, treatment effect differences are too good to be true. Uh, I look at these kinds of curves, and sometimes I'm reminded of the PRAMI trial. I think it was the primary uh, uh, PCI trial that was published from four or six hospitals in London that showed that enormous um, benefit in outcome with um, uh, primary PCI uh, and a strategy of uh, complete uh, revascularization um, versus a strategy of incomplete revascularization. Really one of the first trials of uh, primary PCI uh, to uh, put a stake in the sand. Here the number needed to treat to reduce death or heart failure hospitalization over two years was five, four, and four to five patients, uh, an absolutely extraordinarily uh, low number. I'll point out though that uh, the um, <clears throat> cumulative incidence of death or heart failure hospitalization over two years in the treatment arm, namely those patients who underwent edge-to-edge uh, -edge catheter repair <clears throat> was nearly 50%. <clears throat> so, uh, obviously, the reality here is that we need to do a lot better 
at uh, the multi-pronged um, uh, treatment necessary to prevent death and hospitalization for heart failure in patients with bad ventricles. Uh, obviously, that speaks to the need for prevention and not getting down this road in the first place. Um, it is obvious that uh, these trial results are markedly different from the companion paper that was published at the same time, and that there's been a lot of discussion about how to reconcile the two. And perhaps the most popular um, postulate uh, has been put forward by Paul Grayburn and uh, Milton Packer, whom are both very familiar to this particular audience, looking at the relationship between the severity of mitral regurgitation here on the y-axis, namely effective regurgitation in orifice area, and the size of the ventricle or the left ventricular end diastolic uh, volume. And you can see here for a hypothesized patient with an ejection fraction of 30% and severe MR defined by a regurgitation infraction of 50%, there seems to be <clears throat> a putative linear relationship between end diastolic volume and uh, the severity of mitral regurgitation. And one of the observations made by <clears throat> these investigators was simply that the COAPT patients had relatively smaller ventricles and relatively greater degrees of functional MR compared against the mitra FR patients. And perhaps if we could find this sweet spot uh, where we could convince ourselves that the degree of MR exceeded what would be expected on the size of the ventricle alone, then we should be able to bifurcate our decision making and salvage patients for whom they may have a response to such intervention versus not offer the intervention to those who are less likely to derive benefit. Well, here's a patient of mine, really, really nice man. Uh, you can see here on the left, um, he had a uh, grossly uh, abnormal ventricle and uh, he had a functional mitral regurgitation. You can see posterior leaflet restriction and you can see it's posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation, quantitation of which um, satisfied all criteria for uh, severe MR. And um, after a careful scrutiny and making sure that he would otherwise have met the enrollment criteria for the COAP trial, uh, we offered him mitral clip. You can see here that he appeared to have a technically successful result. <clears throat> he felt warmer after this particular intervention. And he was grateful for the fact that he felt less cold over the course of the next few months. Uh, he died of inexorable heart failure within a six month period of time of uh, this particular uh, intervention, <clears throat> which of course gave me pause as to whether or not I had utilized the appropriate decision making in uh, making a recommendation uh, for him to undergo such treatment. <clears throat> he had exhausted all prior treatments with respect to neurohormonal therapy for his heart failure and uh, biventricular uh, pacing. So I don't think it's as black and white as we would like it to be. Um, we put together this particular expert consensus document pathway. I'm showing you this extraordinarily complicated slide that uh, would likely be meaningless uh, to um, in, in this particular kind of uh, a forum. Um, I just really would like to um, uh, emphasize what's written here on the left-hand side of the screen, interventions for patients with symptomatic secondary mitral regurgitation and reduced ejection fraction of less than 50%. If revascularization is to be indicated, I just would put in a plea here, of course, that uh, we always pause to try to determine if the coronary disease is severe enough to warrant bypass graft surgery as the preferred method of revascularization, which would therefore oftentimes obligate the patients to undergo mitral valve intervention at the time of coronary revascularization surgery. I do think our surgical colleagues have a point to make with us that we are oftentimes in such a rush to offer transcatheter therapies as well as PCI uh, that we can elide over uh, what are several uh, recommend or several indications to consider a more definitive strategy with bypass surgery. As you know, there are questions raised about how, what's the best approach to left main coronary disease, and I'll leave that for a different audience at a different time. But certainly, surgery does have a role. Surgery can reduce mitral regurgitation, can improve functional outcomes, but has not been associated with a survival benefit in patients with secondary MR due to poor ventricular function. So let's um, spend a little bit of time with uh, um, acknowledgement of the TAVR juggernaut and some of those questions I posed earlier in terms of what is now facing uh, the um, 
treatment of patients with uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, and as you know, we've blown past uh, the uh, surgical risk categories to which TAVR can now be applied. And uh, we continue to actively um, investigate patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, those with moderate aortic stenosis and reduced ejection fraction. And uh, as John Forrest has participated nationally as principal investigator, uh, the use of TAVR techniques to um, uh, treat selected patients with bicuspid aortic valve uh, morphology and anatomy. But here are some of my uh, top questions uh, when um, analyzing where we currently stand uh, with uh, TAVR. Uh, I think that uh, it's still, I think, um, <clears throat> remains to be determined uh, as to whether or not we're going to uh, be able to make a claim uh, that uh, TAVR is a useful intervention in an asymptomatic patient. And I think we need to acknowledge what's already happened on the surgical side in this respect. Issues about durability continue to pop up, particularly as younger and younger patients are looking for TAVR to solve their problem of aortic stenosis. By the way, who wants open heart surgery if they have a choice? Hardly anybody. Antithrombotic therapy, which has kind of been a soup, uh, difficult to see through. Uh, conduction system disease, which is not trivial, uh, despite the iterative improvements in uh, device uh, design uh, and implantation techniques, of which John knows a lot, and certainly bicuspid aortic valve disease. Uh, not everybody with bicuspid aortic valve disease is a candidate for consideration. Issues around calcification and its extent and left ventricular outflow tract dimensions and annular size, etc. And then I think something that we are really going to need to come to grips with um, because uh, uh, decision making here has become so highly variable is that what is the long term strategy for younger patients for whom sequential procedures are likely to be in their lifetime. Uh, and uh, the promise of valve and valve technology uh, actually may not pertain uh, to all patients who undergo um, a bioprosthetic valve implantation at a young age. There are thing like, uh, things like coronary height that could get into prosthesis that is implanted. Uh, that would ensue um, with respect to uh, patient prosthesis uh, mismatch. So it's not at all clear. Our surgical colleagues in Germany and elsewhere are actually designing and beginning to execute randomized trials in um, the uh, area of uh, failed bioprosthetic surgically implanted valves, reoperative surgery versus valve and valve tab tabber. I think that's uh, a quite uh, uh, courageous and I think we can learn uh, quite a bit. Uh, there is continued interest in whether we could stand up a trial of uh, surgery versus transcatheter therapy for the treatment of patients with bicuspid disease who would be anatomic candidates for either procedure. Uh, certainly, we would need the help not only of the NIH, but also, I think, of the device companies for this, and it's been a little bit more difficult to uh, sell. Now, we uh, have spent a lot of time over the course of the past 10 years peeling back the onion and identifying earlier points in the natural history of aortic stenosis trouble. What we need to do, of course, is to link all of the advances in multimodality imaging with outcomes, uh, and then to, of course, ask the question as to whether or not if we intervened at an earlier stage in the natural history, uh, would we improve outcomes as a consequence of knowing such things has been pointed out by um, Mark Dweck and his colleagues who've contributed enormous amounts to uh, our understanding of uh, valvular heart disease. Um, and as you can see here, they studied uh, the indexed extracellular volume index uh, as a um, marker of diffuse fibrosis, looking for late gadolinium enhancement as a marker of replacement fibrosis, and then showing this sort of stepwise gradient in survival as a consequence of the magnitude, extent, and severity of, uh, of replacement fibrosis that uh, occurs over a spectrum of time uh, in patients with aortic stenosis. These are three-year outcomes. And as you can see here, there certainly seems to be a gradient of risk depending upon the degree to which um, a fibrosis uh, has begun to encroach on normal myocardial architecture. Of course, this makes biologic sense. And we can capture it at early stages in the disease. Now, can we then design trials that utilize this and uh, then prompt us uh, to uh, execute things at an earlier stage. And our colleagues, and, and particularly Dr. Dweck, have indeed de designed uh, their early TAVR trial equivalent 
along the lines of looking uh, for um, these kinds of signals of uh, myocardial uh, architectural change uh, as a, a criterion for enrollment. Uh, they're also looking at uh, simple things like left ventricular hypertrophy with strain on an electrocardiogram or the presence of an elevated cardiac troponin at baseline. So I do think that this will be highly informative and uh, look forward to uh, the uh, final results of their asymptomatic uh, TAVR trial, uh, which I think would be a nice companion to uh, the one that is ongoing here in the United States. A word about uh, prosthetic valve thrombosis, whether it's uh, TAVR mediated or whether it occurs in the context of uh, SAVR. I've had two patients just in the recent uh, month and a half or so, both of whom had surgically implanted aortic valve um, uh, replacements and uh, who then uh, developed uh, thromboembolic complications. Uh, I think we know a lot less about uh, the safety of uh, bioprosthetic valve implantation than we initially assumed. This problem is far more common among the TAVR valve recipient than the SAVR valve recipient. But then again, uh, given the incredible improvements in CT technology, we're just so much better informed. In fact, we're so uh, much informed, uh, so much better informed that we probably know less well uh, who requires treatment and who does not. Uh, there's a difference between subclinical and clinical thrombosis on these valves that we've learned the hard way. And we've also learned, of course, that we really don't re know uh, what would be the best strategy with respect to um, uh, antithrombotic therapy around the time of implantation. This is just one of several trials, the popular TAVI trial uh, that was presented at ESC, uh, showing that if you compare what we've been doing for several years, dual antiplatelet therapy versus single antiplatelet therapy, that the use of single antiplatelet therapy is not only associated with a marked reduction in bleeding complications, but really no change in the risk of ischemic events over time. Uh, and I think this is a, a very important contribution to the field to provide some clarity. There have been some other smaller randomized trials that have uh, not met um, the um, appropriate benchmark from which we could make uh, decisions. And I think you know the story very well about combination uh, antiplatelet plus low dose anticoagulant therapy versus antiplatelet therapy uh, as well. And knowing of course that uh, uh, that also has uh, not only uh, been shown not to be effective, uh, but also uh, hazardous. Uh, and I think that um, this particular uh, aspect of um, uh, clinical trial design has kind of passed us by, uh, and it's time to uh, ask uh, some more uh, important questions as to uh, how to improve TAVR outcomes over the long haul. Now, a word about asymptomatic aortic stenosis, and, and that's simply uh, that uh, it's been less than a year since these trial results were presented at the American Heart Association and then published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the recovery trial from South Korea, uh, which I think um, is a startling example of um, how to do a clinical trial with a relatively small number of patients. This is the same group that taught us about uh, the benefits of early surgery to prevent embolic complications in the context of infective endocarditis. Well, here they are with um, a few hundred patients uh, who had very severe aortic stenosis defined by a peak jet velocity over four and a half meters per second or a mean gradient in excess of 50 and 60 uh, odd percent of these folks undoubtedly, uh, as you would anticipate, uh, had uh, bicuspid aortic valve disease. And as you can see here, if randomized to a strategy of conservative watchful waiting until a class one indication appears versus preemptive surgery within a few weeks of the diagnosis of very severe aortic stenosis. You can see here that early surgery beat a conservative strategy and beat it by a large margin. Perioperative mortality in this study was zero. And as you can see here, the cumulative incidence of operative mortality or death from cardiovascular causes over uh, about an average uh, follow-up time of, of five years um, demonstrated uh, in a very convincing way that early surgery has a lot to offer. This is a surgical trial and patients with very severe aortic stenosis, particularly those who are at uh, low risk for surgery uh, should be considered uh, for this kind of intervention in the hands of an expert surgeon. 
Now we spend a lot of time uh, uh, with respect to um, our recent advances around the structural heart disease team and, and our appreciation for valvular heart disease, uh, focusing over here on the right, uh, stage D severe symptomatic valvular heart disease. And um, I'd like to sort of bring us back uh, to the left-hand side of uh, this um, schematic which attempts to outline the progressive stages of valvular heart disease. I'd like to take us back uh, to uh, consider what um, I hopefully um, will be some breakthroughs in um, the epidemiology and the science behind identifying patients as early as possible uh, and then coming up with medical therapies that would actually prevent the progression of uh, disease to the extent that an intervention would be uh, indicated. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, that is my uh, great hope. This may apply uh, more to uh, patients with uh, aortic stenosis than it does with mitral regurgitation uh, of a primary nature, at least at this time. So here are some data from a Canadian study that really caught my attention, and these are very, very well known uh, to this particular audience. This is an epidemiologic study looking at incident aortic stenosis in Ontario. Uh, and as you can see here, the population attributable risk for the development of incident aortic stenosis was 34% comprised of uh, hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. Uh, another way, of course, to look at this is that if you could eradicate hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia, perhaps we would have saved a third of the population from having developed aortic stenosis over the timeline of this particular study. And certainly, these atherosclerotic risk factors have been identified in association with trileaflet calcific aortic stenosis for decades. Uh, but here's a very powerful epidemiologic set of observations that says, wow, we really need to pay attention to this. Uh, as we get older and these particular uh, atherosclerotic risk factors and their biologic inflammatory substrates begin to interact, it's no um, surprise, of course, that valvular endothelium would be susceptible to pathologic changes. And can we ratchet back with respect to our time course and intervene on these at earlier points? Uh, it's interesting to note uh, that the Partner 2 investigators looked at a few thousand patients and retrospectively came up with this observation published earlier this year that uh, patients in a uh, intermediate or high surgical risk group undergoing TAVR who were treated at baseline, at baseline prior to the procedure itself with an ACE inhibitor or ARB enjoyed a much improved survival, as you can see here in blue, compared to those patients who were not treated with an ACE inhibitor or ARB prior to TAVR intervention. Obviously a um, potentially horribly confounded um, study uh, with respect to, well, what were the indications for ACE or ARB therapy at baseline? Uh, how many patients continued treatment uh, in the early or late phases uh, following uh, TAVR? Uh, and uh, how well did they actually adhere to medical therapy? Uh, but this may be a signal uh, that these particular agents and their ability to mediate uh, such things as nitric oxide availability, or perhaps even control blood pressure, uh, may prove positive dividends. Uh, this is now, I think, uh, the uh, basis for a new grant proposal uh, to consider uh, the use of these particular uh, agents in the management of patients with aortic stenosis. And then, of course, uh, the lipoprotein A story, which continues to pop up everywhere. Uh, you're familiar with um, these data from George uh, Thanasoulis and his colleagues published a long period of time ago in the New England Journal of Medicine showing uh, a hit uh, with respect to the uh, LPA um, single nucleotide uh, polymorphic associations. Um, I think biochemical and biologic reasons for which lipoprotein A and those that uh, those other bio biochemical moieties with which it travels uh, to um, uh, alter um, the uh, oxidative potential across endothelial barriers and uh, lead to uh, the deposition of uh, abnormal elements within the subendothelial space. Uh, and then you're off with this uh, cascade of inflammatory reactions and then eventually uh, changing uh, the phenotypic uh, uh, characteristics of uh, valvular uh, cells and making them more like osteoblasts and laying down active uh, bone uh, protein. Uh, so lipoprotein A uh, is definitely a target. 
Uh, I do think that there's uh, quite uh, a lot of interest in lipoprotein A. Uh, these are some data from um, the uh, Montreal group, uh, as you know, uh, showing uh, a, an oligosense, um, uh, antisense oligonucleotide uh, that has been uh, shown to reduce levels of uh, lipoprotein A in this dose ranging study uh, published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, similar observations have been brought to bear with PCSK9 inhibitors. I know my Timmy collaborators uh, had uh, made observations as well as others with respect to the interplay between PCSK9 inhibitors and lipoprotein A reductions and the potential effect on uh, the development of aortic stenosis over time. Uh, these are now also the foundations of the interventional uh, work uh, of a medical nature that is going on in space surrounding patients with aortic stenosis. And uh, lastly, uh, our colleagues uh, in Europe, uh, Stephanie Demmler and others, uh, published an interesting page, paper in the European Heart Journal earlier th this year, uh, looking at chip driver mutations associated with inflammation uh, that were also associated with reduced survival uh, following TAVR in patients with aortic stenosis. Uh, Peter Libby and his group wrote this uh, very interesting uh, editorial uh, extending uh, the list of uh, attributes that are commonly shared across atherosclerosis and trileaflet calcific aortic uh, stenosis uh, to include a clon clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So I think there are a lot of interesting biologic questions that are being asked again, uh, but now be uh, because of some other um, advances in fields uh, such as lipidology, especially around PCSK9 inhibitors and lipoprotein A, we may have a real chance to alter the natural history of this disease. So let me end uh, by reminding us that uh, it takes a village uh, to manage patients with valvular heart disease. And let's not forget uh, the social determinants of health uh, that contribute importantly uh, to um, poor outcomes and disadvantaged people and the structural uh, racism that uh, characterizes uh, much of what it is that we built and attempt to do. Access is obviously of uh, greatest importance in getting people into the system so that interventions can be made on their behalf. It is my hope that we can achieve uh, some of the um, aspirations of personalized medicine. Uh, this particular field, of course, is talked more about with regard to uh, cancer uh, therapeutics, uh, immunotherapy, and all that's occurred in that particular space. What I've attempted to do is to try to bring some of those principles of personalized medicine to individual uh, patient decision-making. Uh, and I do very much appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Uh, I do hope, John, that we have enough time here at the end uh, for a few questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Guerra, thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, really a, a wonderful talk, a wonderful tribute uh, to Dr. Davidson, so thank you. Um, I, folks can type in questions or raise their hand. Let me let me start by a, a basic question for you, and that is, you know, one of the areas that I think we've struggled in here as we've as we've looked towards things like asymptomatic studies, and we're in a study like that, is how to best recruit for that in an era where it's clearly not necessarily going with the guideline, guidelines. I think. When one of the things that I learned from Dr. Davidson is that if you have on your team a cardiac surgeon and your study is evaluating something comparing it to cardiac surgery, you get all of those patients when you team up with a cardiac surgeon. When you're doing something where you're evaluating what the guidelines would say, which is just watch these patients versus have them come in for asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a different study. And I'm hoping maybe you can shed some light on, on your thoughts around that and maybe what you've done, because I know you guys have been successful up there at Brigham. Well, uh, thanks for those uh, comments. I think uh, first we should recognize how hard it is to uh, conduct clinical research in the COVID-19 era. Uh, and we've all been struggling with uh, uh, how to um, provide uh, patients with the information they need to execute an informed consent. And we've all struggled with getting patients to the hospital and uh, keeping the research coordinators and um, everybody else on, on target. Uh, secondly, I think when the questions are so highly nuanced, nuanced it's very important for patients to have access to uh, more than one individual within the research group. Uh, I think it's very easy to prevent, uh, present a very biased uh, uh, 
um, <clears throat> attempt at uh, informed consent, depending upon who you are and what your interests are. Uh, and uh, what, what we've attempted to do is to make sure that patients receive information from people across a broad range, including surgeons, interventionalists, and then heart failure experts or valve cardiologists, and um, allowing patients as much time as necessary. It's, it's uh, excruciatingly uh, slow. Uh, it does take many iterative attempts, uh, but we do think that um, uh, for the right patient who wishes to uh, do the research and uh, ask the important questions, it eventually does pay off. Full transparency and making sure that people understand uh, that um, uh, this could not, uh, this may end up in ways that they didn't anticipate, especially when they're asymptomatic. Yeah. So just questions from the group from uh, Dr. Sadegi. Um, you know, in addition to the state of the art clinical care, do you think basic and translational research should be an integral part of a comprehensive valve center and could differentiate centers of real excellence if one goal of such centers is to create knowledge and advance science? Wow, that's perfect. I, I think you should publish that. Um, I, I, I have nothing to uh, add to that, of course, and I think in a place like Yale and a place here like the Brigham and Harvard, we have an obligation to do that. Not only should it happen, but we are obliged to do it. You are the cutting edge. People are looking to you for advances in knowledge, uh, and um, this is the means by which things are generated. The engine is the patient. And um, the book of business is getting patients cared for. It's very clinical, it's very tedious, et cetera. But it's research that I think is going to uh, make a difference. And it's exciting to be part of that. Dr. Sufer, I don't know if you're there or you're unmuted now. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, I, I wasn't sure if you had a question. You're unmuted, but it's, if not, no worries. No, I know. I'm sorry. It was a great lecture. Thank you. So I think it's, it's just after nine and I know I have to run uh, to the operating room because I have a patient on the table presently. So uh, Dr. O'Gara, thank you uh, so much for spending some time with us this morning. It was really a, a true pleasure. Uh, I know we all look forward to welcoming you back to New Haven, um, hopefully sometime in 2021 or thereafter when we are, when interstate travel and youth hockey and all those other things are, are back uh, occurring. So thank you very much. Thanks again for this opportunity. And uh, I wish all of you well. Uh, please stay healthy. Thank you again.